Hello, everyone. Salam. Welcome to today's press conference of the COP presidency, COP29 presidency, on Food, Water and Agriculture Day. I have here the COP20 presidency lead negotiator, Yalshin Rafiev, the Azerbaijanis Minister of Agriculture, His Excellency Majnun Mamadov, Next to me, <clears throat> Jala Ibrahimova, the Action Agenda Lead, Head of Secretariat, Climate and Clean Air Coalition from UNEP, Martina Otto, and from FAO, the Director, Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment, uh, Kave Sahedi. We will first hear quick remarks, uh, and we start with the lead negotiator, Mr. Rafiev, you have the floor. Thank you, Alex. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a pleasure to join you today. And I'm great, grateful to be joined by my fellow panelists. Today, our thematic focuses on food, water, and agriculture. Urgent work is needed to help the agricultural sectors adapt to a warming planet. We have now launched the Baku Harmonia Climate Initiative for farmers in partnership with FAO. This aims to give farmers the tools to build climate resilience. It will br bring together the landscape of existing initiatives onto one platform. It will also work with financial institutions to produce accessible guidelines for farmers to secure funding. While building resilience, we are also committed to taking every opportunity for mitigation, particularly on methane. Previous COPs have already made progress on methane. The Global Methane Pledge from COP26 now has already nearly 160 countries, including Azerbaijan. To deliver the pledge, we must address all the major sources of methane emissions, including fossil fuels, agriculture, and organic waste. At COP28, we saw important progress on methane from fossil fuels. Over 50 companies, including SOCAR, signed the oil and gas decarbonization charter, committing to reach near zero methane emissions. To build on and complement these efforts, we have focused on the key priority of reducing methane from organic waste. In 2022, food waste generated up to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Today, we are launching the COP29 Reducing Methane from Organic Waste Declaration. This commits countries to creating sectoral targets on food waste within future NDCs. Here, I thank Martina Otto, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and UNEP for supporting countries to include methane reduction strategies in NDCs. As of this morning, more than 30 countries, representing almost 50% of the global methane emissions from organic waste, have endorsed the declaration. This includes eight of the world's 10 largest emitters of methane from organic waste. Today's declaration is also part of a wider package to drive mitigation this year. This includes pledges and declarations on energy storage, grids, green energy zones and corridors, hydrogen, digitalization, cities, and tourism. We are building to support and we are building support and momentum for these different initiatives. We have also appointed ministers Tore Sandvik of Norway and Dion George of South Africa to consult on what a feasible mitigation outcome could look like. Friends, the G20 has now issued its leaders' communique, and we are grateful for the support they have pledged for the COP29 presidency. We appreciate the signal that they have sent of their intention to accelerate the reform of the international financial architecture. We thank them for their support for a successful NCQG outcome in Baku. We now need to translate political will into practical work. Ministers from around the world arrived in Baku yesterday to begin the final week of negotiations. On the NCQG, 
You heard the COP president set out the tracks we are already following the, to deliver a successful outcome. This includes ministerial consultations on key political elements and working sessions for heads of delegations. You also heard the president say that we are working towards producing a first iteration of a full draft text on NCQG by tomorrow evening. We need everyone to focus on playing their part to make this happen. We are running an inclusive and transparent process, but the outcome will only be as good as parties' commitment to help us build solutions. We have been active. We have stepped up the pace. We have escalated the engagement, and we are asking now everyone to rise the occasion. Friends, we have a clear and robust plan. The world expects us to follow it in its final stretch. I'll now hand over the other panelists and look forward to taking your questions. I thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Minister. Excellencies, dear distinguished press members, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great honor to address you today on this significant occasion as we come together at COP29 to discuss this critical intersections of food, water, and agriculture in the face of climate change. I extend my gratitude to the COP29 presidency for prioritizing these issues and to all the distinguished participants for their commitment to sustainable solutions. Agriculture is a vital sector of Azerbaijan's economy, driving GDP growth, supporting rural livelihoods, and safeguarding national food security. Over the past decade, Azerbaijan has made remarkable strides in modernizing the sector, investing in technology, promoting sustainable practices, and diversifying production with a focus on high-value crops. In Azerbaijan, we see increasing participation of women farmers and are prioritizing the involvement of youth, strengthening human resource capabilities, advancing research and innovation, improving water management systems, and implementing green subsidy programs to encourage sustainable practices are at the core of our strategy. Today, we are proud officially to launch the Baku Harmonia Climate Initiative for Farmers, an inclusive platform designed to empower farmers, particularly women and youth, and strengthen global collaboration. Harmonia focuses on sharing knowledge, facilitating climate finance, and addressing the unique challenges faced by farmers in agriculture. It reflects our belief that farmers must be at the heart of climate solutions. Under the vision of the President Ilham Aliyev, Azerbaijan is proud to serve as a bridge between nations, fostering dialogue and collaboration. By 2030, we aim to meet 30% of our energy needs through renewables and drive innovations, creating synergies between agriculture and energy transition. Azerbaijan is also advancing its commitments under the Paris Agreement. We are finalizing our nationally determined contribution, aligned with the 1.5 centigrade degree pathway, and preparing our national adaptation plan to address critical issues such as water scarcity and climate resilience in agriculture. Azerbaijan is playing its role as a bridge between nations to bring the parties together. We remain dedicated to fostering partnerships, driving innovation, and ensuring agriculture remains a cornerstone of global climate action. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister. Uh, next speaker is Martina Otto. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is uh, hosted, convened by the UN Environment Programme, and we're a partnership of over 180 countries and international organizations dealing with short-lived climate pollutants or super pollutants. We are also the Secretariat for the Global Methane Pledge, and here we play a key role in galvanizing further progress towards reaching the goal of collectively reducing methane emissions by 30% from 2020 levels by 2030. We were very pleased to support the COP29 Presidency's declaration on reducing organic waste methane today, earlier today, that has seen such a success in terms of support. And I want to highlight that reducing methane emissions this decade is our emergency break in the climate uh, remit to cut the uh, emergency. We uh, need to harness 
the fact that methane has a much higher global warming potential and is shorter lived in the atmosphere, which means we can curb near-term warming. Organic waste represents 20%. We heard that. But it is an area where we can take action for a number of good reasons. One is um, that we don't want to let methane go in the atmosphere. It can be a resource, can be an energy source. We want to valorize organic waste because it becomes, uh, it can be protein, for example. And we want to make sure we're not losing uh, waste, um, food that could feed people instead of feeding climate change. So uh, uh, with that, uh, I think it was absolutely critical that this declaration put this issue center stage. And we encourage all countries uh, to include this into the NDCs. There are our investment plans for the period to come uh, so that we can make sure that the financing flows the level of ambition. And the CCIC is supporting over 30 countries already in this and stands ready to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Otto. Next is Kave Sahedi. You have the floor. Thank you so much. So, I guess the, 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 the key message from, from uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of, of, of the UN is, is that transforming agriculture and food systems is going to be critical if we are to achieve the Paris Agreement, whether it's on the side of adaptation and building resilience or indeed on the side of mitigation. And, and on this Food, Agriculture and Water Day, we're so delighted that the COP29 presidency has been shining a light on this, including through the Baku Harmonia Climate Initiative for Farmers that uh, the minister uh, spoke to. And it really is an initiative about continuing the momentum uh, on supporting and scaling up climate action through agriculture and food systems and setting in place a COP-to-COP -COP mechanism. So it's not an initiative for one COP, but one that continues this momentum from COP to COP uh, and that's really what the event this morning uh, was about. It includes focusing on how to release finance. Finance is a, is, a is a vital enabler and not enough climate finance is moving in the direction of, of, of solutions that only agriculture and food systems can provide, including at the farmer and community level. And of course, it is about building the momentum towards ensuring that countries fully incorporate the ambition on agriculture and, climate, uh, and uh, on agriculture and food systems into their next generation of NDCs, the NDC 3.0, because only in that way will they be able to reach the ambition that is required for the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time now for your questions. If you please could identify yourself and your media organization. The microphone is coming and just a reminder, we have also Azerbaijani English interpretation. Um, let me start the gentleman here, first row. Hello, thank you so much. Sabir Safarov, Real TV, Azerbaijan. So my question is to the Minister Majnun Mamadov uh, about the irrigation systems which are modernized in the Azerbaijan and about the uh, water management. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have almost totally transferred all our subsidy programs uh, to support farmers who implement modern irrigation systems. Right now in Azerbaijan, out of all our irrigated lands, only 8% is uh, where it is used, the modern irrigation uh, systems, whether they're drip irrigation or private irrigation, sprinklers doesn't matter. So first of all, our aim is to increase that, and we aim to reach that in a midterm uh, almost to more than 90%. Uh, second, uh, as a strategy of uh, renewing the losses or uh, decreasing the losses that we have in uh, water is uh, create as much as possible reservoirs, uh, transfer our uh, transportation of water to the closed irrigation system, and uh, definitely implement the modern irrigations in place as much as possible. And of course, count every drop of the water that we have in hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, uh, the lady in the first row. 
Megan Roding from um, Climate Home News. Um, Minister Mamadov, you mentioned that Azerbaijan is uh, finalizing its NDC. Um, can you tell us when you will be announcing um, your NDC, or at least your NDC targets? Is it going to be here at COP29, or will it be by the end of the year? Many people were expecting it to be here, and we haven't heard anything yet. So I'm just wondering if you can provide a little bit of clarification there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't uh, name the exact date, frankly, by today, but we are really working on it. If we are able to finalize it by the end of the COP, but if uh, Mr. Rafi wants to follow up with the question, that's all from my part. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, the, the process itself is very co complex one, and uh, that incorporates uh, significant data collection processes, significant coordination among the agencies to put up in place a really tangible outcome. For us, the quality is more important than the time itself, so, than rushing in, in terms of timing. So therefore, uh, yeah, it, it is in the final stage. We cannot predict the exact date, uh, but the, the work is going on. Thank you. The gentleman here in the aisle with a black shirt. Uh, Farid Hasanov, BBC News, Azerbaijan Service. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Mamadov. Uh, when I was in, uh, in, in the regions of Azerbaijan, some, uh, uh, some farmers, including the beekeepers, said that they were deprived uh, from uh, government uh, subsidies for, for, this, uh, for this year. And also, they also worried about the, uh, the fuel price. When the fuel price increased in, in, in this summer, they said that there's, there's nothing changed in, in the subsidies coming from the government. Uh, I'm uh, wondering if, if, the, if the, your ministry is planning to uh, increase these subsidies for the next year. Or, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I'd like to mention the main aim of the subsidy. The main, main aim of the subsidy is to cover some portion of the cost uh, which uh, occurred by the farmers. Uh, the support for the beekeepers uh, started a few years back, 2020, if I'm not mistaken, and stopped in 2023. Uh, with that support, the number of bee families increased more than 60 times and reached almost six. Uh, more, close to 600,000, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in that sense, as a government, we have reached our goal using that subsidy mechanism. Right now, we will implement the big uh, subsidies, but mainly in Karabakh, Eastern Zengazu regions, and in Nakhchivan, most probably. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman in the second row, please. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Vishu Mohan from Times of India. Uh, my question is to lead negotiator. Uh, you just said that you appreciated uh, the signal which you got from the G20 leaders. Would you please specify what kind of signals you got from them? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have been encouraged by, of course, the positive signals were expected from uh, the G20 summit to, to, to give a, uh, an impetus to our ongoing efforts here. Uh, since we are doing a collective effort to achieve an important outcome within the UNFCCC process. So there are two major issues that I would say we took as a positive signal. First, they pledged their support and commitment to the COP, well, COP29, the successful negotiations here at COP29, paving the way for the adoption of the new collective quantified goal. The second is they, the leaders of G20 once again recommitted themselves to the UNFCCC process. And they have once again uh, reiterated their support, uh, the whole uh, multilater multilateralism in general, when it comes to the climate domain, uh, they, they have expressed uh, that and this, is, uh, this is the process that can deliver, really. The lady here in the second row, please. Thanks. Hi, Victoria Seabrook from Sky News. Colombia is trying to forge a different path. It wants to leave its fossil fuels in the ground and find uh, and diversify, it, diversify its economy so it can do so. Azerbaijan's policy seems to be to pump as much oil and gas as it can. Why won't it at least consider 
an, an alternative path? Would, would, is it open to thinking about uh, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, of course, we cannot comment on any individual country's uh, internal policies, but in Azerbaijan, we have been clear, and that was also the messages that have been communicated throughout the COP itself. And even before that, Azerbaijan is in the path of uh, ensuring uh, energy transition in a way that to increase the portion of the renewable energy in the en general energy mix uh, by 2030 to reach to 30%. Uh, but but the, fi the figures that are uh, being updated shows that we can reach at that point even uh, earlier. And Azerbaijani government is investing a lot on renewable energy. Um, our even COP29 initiatives, the president's initiatives, have once again demonstrated the political willingness of Azerbaijan to uh, first implement the global stock take outcomes, the second also to ensure the smooth transition of energy. Thank you. The lady here in row three. Hi, Chichai Jahangili from A News. My question is to the Minister Mamadov. How has Azerbaijan Smart Villages initiative progressed in addressing uh, rural development challenges and what lessons have been learned in implementation of these projects that could guide future efforts? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the first ever smart village project uh, in Azerbaijan was built in Karabakh, in eastern Zengazur, sorry, in a uh, region called Zengilan, and the name of the village is Ahala. Uh, is, I'll touch upon more on the agricultural side of it, uh, because as a village itself, it's uh, very green oriented. Majority of the energy is coming from the hydro energy using the water energy. Uh, but on agricultural part, we are right now uh, investing a lot in the infrastructure to develop the parcelization of the land, to develop the roads within the farmlands, and to develop the drainage system also as well. And bring the water, pressurized water, uh, so that farmers can install modern irrigation systems. So compared to other parts of Azerbaijan here from scratch, from zero, and from the lessons learned we, from 90s and beginning of 2000s, uh, from our land projects in other parts of Azerbaijan. There, we prepare everything from the be beginning. We level the land, we invest in the infrastructure for the uh, farmers, and the farmers will receive parcelized, uh, ready-made uh, plots of lands in order to start their uh, farming operations. Thank you. The lady here um, in the middle. Yeah, the microphone's coming. Hi, I'm Rebecca from Carbon Pulse. My question is to the uh, Mr. Rafiev. I'm just wondering, how are you going to ensure that language on phasing out fossil fuels gets into the final text? Yeah, of course, this COP29 presidency is one of the major important priorities to ensure a balanced package of outcomes, which include also the outcome related to mitigation. We understand the GST, imp the implementation of the global stock take in its entirety is an important expectation for COP29, and we have a robust plan to, uh, to, to do it throughout this COP. Thank you. The gentleman, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Nohara from Japanese Public Television, NHK. I have uh, one question about uh, G20 declaration uh, to uh, Mr. Chief Negotiator Rakiev. Um, in the uh, document of joint declaration of G20 summit, there is a mention uh, about the need to foster private capital flows for climate action uh, for de developing countries. And do you think this uh, aspect will be important also uh, during the uh, COP29 uh, uh, negotiation? And it, does it bring any uh, hint or positive effect during the negotiation or not? Thank you so much. Uh, of course, the one thing that we are all unanimous in our position is that the finance, current finance on climate is not sufficient. It, it needs to be scaled up. 
And there are several views on that, whether it should be only the state, or whether it should include the business community, the private sector. The private sector has an important role in this process. Whether on the negotiated track we will get anything at the end, or whether out of process contribution from the business community side, the business sector's involvement is very important. Our high-level champion, Nigar Arpadarai, in that regard, has worked a lot throughout the year. Uh, recently, we had on the 14th of November, uh, in the first thematic day on finance, a big business and philanthropy event, having more than 400 C-level representation from the business community, once again demonstrating that business sector itself also is very much interested in attending, contributing the global climate action. Thank you. Gentleman here in the first row. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Carr from Kazi.org, a climate news website. Um, there's been a lot of delay built in to this system over 30 years. Um, and one thing that's happening is that when people are meant to put in their NDCs, they just don't do it and they delay it. Can you just talk to why that's happening, and is there a structural problem with the, the, the program? Because if people keep delaying their pledges, or their NDCs as we call them, then the incentive for others to join in um, falls away, and it becomes about just delaying so that you can make more money out of land, make more money out of burning fossil fuels, and just <laughs> not engage with the process properly. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that all countries have different starting points. Uh, not all countries are starting the process in the same footing with the same amount of resources, with the same amount of uh, capacity to do this. And uh, having the judgment of uh, the countries uh, performing on their indices, preparing or submission of their indices is something that needs to be carefully considered. Therefore, uh, we need to understand whether, that is why Baku COP is very much important in our view, being an enabling COP. We, what we have been promoting since the beginning is that for the countries to be prepared and to, uh, to design their own indices and be more uh, proactive in this process, they need to make sure that the means of implementation are available for them. And the Baku COP being an enabling COP is expected to deliver on new collective quantified goal, which in our view is an important also uh, factor that needs to be taken into account for many developing countries. But of course, uh, the NDC process itself, you know, we have two pillars in our COP29 vision. One is uh, enhancing ambition and another one is enabling action. And under en enhancing ambition pillar, the NDCs, BTRs, and NAPs are important deliverables expected from the parties. And on the NDC side, the outlined uh, features that I have uh, mentioned are the important factors, but also in the BTRs, biannual transparency reports. The countries need to have the relevant capacity, relevant uh, uh, training for data collection to prepare these reports and submit. And that, that was the very reason why COP29 presidency, uh, starting from the beginning of the year, uh, organized several global workshops, regional workshops for the parties to build their capacity, to have the necessary skills, and also at the same time, providing a Baku transparency platform, we have uh, uh, tried to ensure that there is also sufficient funding available for the parties to prepare and submit their BTR. So different starting points for all countries, various uh, um, capacity of resources uh, that really, um, I think, set the, uh, the capabilities in different way. Thank you very much for today. Chok Sagul, see you tomorrow, 1.15, same place. Thank you. <laughs>